Welcome to Thursday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com. It is presented by the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. That's Cadillac. And we'll be here for the next hour to talk Giants football with you as we begin our NFL prospect preview shows. Today we'll be talking about the Oregon Ducks and the Oregon State Beavers and the guys that they'll be sending into the NFL draft. I'm Paul Dottino. He is Jonathan Casillas. So glad you could join us today. We'll get to our guests in just a minute. Our number, if you want to dial us up later on in the show, is 201-939-4513. You'll also be able to find an archive of this program and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. Quick news item, though, before we get to our first guest, Field Yates. A uh, longtime uh, NFL exec, now a, a part of the TV media, uh, reporting today that the Giants have restructured Dexter Lawrence, given him some bonus money up front, lowers his cap number this year by about $7 million, adds some space for the Giants so they've got a little more maneuverability. And it makes sense to me, Jonathan. He's a guy entering his prime. He just got a new contract last year. You know he's going to be here for a while, so you can afford to to put money to the back end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you said, he he is the you know the focal point of uh, the defense this year, and you know new defensive coordinator, couple new pieces on defense. You know, you got a star worth in Brian Burns, and you know, like you said, Dexter's not going nowhere. You know, he's literally the anchor in the middle of the field. Yeah. You know, and and I, I love what Joe Shane and and the cap guys and all of those guys that are working uh, contractually wise for all of the guys' finances that they're moving stuff around to free up some more space to bring in some more valuable players. Of course, they also reportedly brought in Darnay Holmes last uh, last uh, yesterday, not last week, yesterday. Uh, Holmes had a really good season on special teams coverage yeah, he did. last year. Kind of changed direction of his career from being a corner and a slot corner really was good on special teams. Yeah, and that's very valuable. You know, uh, I, as you know, my career, uh, my first five or six years, I was basically a special teams whiz, you know, and that kept me playing in the league for a long time. I know a yeah. lot of guys, defensive backs that played uh, an extensive amount of years. Pearson Prelo, when I first got to the league, I think he was in like year 13 or something like that. You can last a while. K- kind of like the Slater, you know, how Slater, sure. you know, played for so long, never really played wide receiver, just like Pearson Prelo, never really played safety. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm talking about actually playing on the field, but had a lot of value for special teams. And look, Darnay Holmes, and, you know, a couple years ago, he was against CeeDee Lamb in the slot, you know, and he got tore up. Who doesn't get tore by CeeDee Lamb in the yeah. slot? You know, and he, he had his struggles and his battles, but to stay in the league, you know, still doing his thing, maybe re-finding himself on special teams look he can play in the league for a long time if he becomes a special teams ace all right good stuff just to make sure you understand what the bonus thing with dexter lawrence because they uh gave him an extra bonus now it lowers this year's cap number but then it spreads out the money over a longer period of time so the back end of his contract now has a higher cap number than it would have otherwise but again there's no reason to believe that he won't fulfill that contract because he's in his prime yeah so having said that that gives you a little bit of the economics behind what the giants are doing right now we now go to our first guest as we begin our annual month-long season previews of guys who will be entering the nfl draft and we start with the oregon ducks and radio analyst and former quarterback mike jorgensen and of course the giants uh went to the well to oregon uh to get Kayvon thibodeau just a couple of years ago and that's worked out pretty well and Mike uh, Paul Dottino and Jonathan Casillas is with you this morning thanks so much for taking the time to join us hope everything is well out by you hey guys thanks for having me on big Giants fan on the west coast you just need to know that since the Fran Tarkenton days so that takes me back and kind of ages me a little bit too but at the same time Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate well, it. Well, don't feel too old, Mike, because I'm with you. I watched Tarkenton. My, I watched Tarkenton. I grew up with Tarkenton myself. Jonathan's the young pup in the room. Yeah. Oh, um, Mike, full disclosure, okay? My two favorite quarterbacks in this draft are Drake May and Bo Nix. Oh, wow. One and two in that order. Now, poke some holes in Bo Nix for me because I just love so much about this guy. Nitpick me. And take the other side and try to give me some warts wow. first. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what. I mean, I, I would have nicked. I would if you'd have asked me that three years ago when he was coming from Auburn to Oregon, that would have been a whole different story because there were all kinds of holes you could you know, poke in him from a standpoint of careless with the ball, trying to ad lib in certain situations where he maybe didn't need to. 
uh, you know, trying to do too much on his own when he was playing at Auburn. I mean, there's lots of different things you can nitpick him at, and I think that's what people were scratching their head about when he came to Oregon. It's like, okay, I've seen him on TV and seen some of the different things that happened. He's become an absolutely different guy in a better system, I think, here at Oregon that he played in under the two offensive coordinators, making him adaptive that he played for. He went from being kind of a a somewhat efficient guy to a highly efficient guy. So to ask me to poke holes in the guy, I love him. So you're asking, you're asking the wrong person to do that because I, I love the guy. I mean, what he brought to the table here in Eugene and the university of Oregon, uh, the, the humble kid he is, uh, and what he became and admittedly said, I wasn't that way at one time, but learned his lessons. Uh, the leader that he was when he came here, obviously the numbers that he put up, and what the Ducks did over the two years. I mean, 8,000 yards in two years, and you look at the you know, TD to interception ratio, the pass completion percentage, and when you look at the three years at Auburn that where, where it wasn't very good, 60% pass completion percentage, mm-hmm. 39 TDs, 16 interceptions, where he comes here, he goes 74 and 10 <laughs> for 8,000 wow. yards, and between 72 and 77, in fact, he set the all-time record this last year, the pass completion percentage. So I can't. You used to ask me a question I cannot answer for the guy because he just <laughs> really did it all. He became less careless with the ball, just made much smarter decisions, I think. He's played a lot of football. His open field awareness is so good. Uh, he's accurate on the move. His pocket presence is good. He extends plays. But now what he does when he extends the plays is he doesn't get careless trying to make the impossible throw. Mm-hmm. He throws it out of bounds or he just takes it to the next down and knows that he can do that. So, um I, I didn't answer any of that for you, and I'm not going to. <laughs> Good answer, Mike. Mike, so I, I think the knock on him, and, and just clearly by just on paper, is his age. He's a little bit older. He's 24 years old. Yeah. But what I've seen from him is a steady improvement statistically-wise. What is his ceiling? What, what is Bo Nix's ceiling? Uh, you know, 24 years old, coming in as a rookie to any one of these franchises, he's probably going to be a little bit more mature than most rookies. But what is this guy's ceiling? Yeah, I mean, obviously he's played a lot of football. And when you say more mature, I'll just say it that way, too. He's played a lot of football, played a lot of football games, and has been in a lot of different types of situations. So I I see that as an advantage. Uh, I I just think he's the type of guy, I feel like he's a more athletic Drew Brees, in, in my opinion. He can throw the ball at all the different angles. He's got a really good pocket awareness, but he's he's a better athlete that can ex- extend plays mm-hmm. where teams have to prepare for his legs. I think his ceiling is great. At the same time, I don't. I think his ceiling is going to be really high from the standpoint of his ability, you know, to be productive with his legs, with his arm. If he's able to come in, I think, and, and settle in behind somebody, I don't, I don't think he's the type of guy you probably want to come in and throw to the wolves as a starter. It'd be great if he was in a situation where he could come in behind somebody. Uh, and learn for a year or two. But at the same time, you know, he's an older guy. They may expect him, like you said, to come in and, and produce right away, depending on who picks him. Mike, I want to get to some of your other prospects, but one more about Knicks. Uh, from your perspective, and I know it may be hard because you're right out there in the middle of it and not in necessarily in the mm-hmm. NFL uh, trade win, so to speak, but what do you hear in terms of the teams that may be the most interested in him? Because there's a lot of poop going around the NFL, and I'll say that because you never know how much is real and how much is truly that pile of horse you know what, uh, about teams <laughs> maybe trying to trade up into the back of the first round, thinking that that might be the hot spot to get him. I wish I could answer that question for you. I'm a college guy, and in, in, in as much as I want to say, and I have a full-time job, too, so, so saying that I dial into the NFL rumor mills and that type of deal, I mean, I've heard Chicago mention is the main, is the main one just from a standpoint of are they really going to go all in on the Caleb Williams type of situation or mm. is he falling down the ladder and you move a guy like that up the ladder a little bit uh, you know I mean it was it was nice to be able to see you mentioned at the very beginning and I'm not going to talk about Drake May because I don't know much, enough about him but you know he and Nick's went head to head in the Holiday Bowl last year down in San Diego yep. so I got to see Drake May and what a what a hell of an athlete he is yeah. 
and a and a bigger body version of it mm-hmm. too. And so it's going to be interesting to see what he does. But you know, thinking about where and who's looked at Bo and that type of deal. I've heard the Raiders, I've heard the Bears, I've heard a lot of different things out there, but to be honest with you, I haven't dug into it that deep to be able to see where the rumors are coming from. So. All right, let, let's go to some of the other guys, and I think just because we're coming off the quarterback, we got to go to the receiver. Troy Franklin yeah. is another guy I really like a lot, and I think would be a great second-round value if if your team needs an impact receiver and doesn't get one in the first round. Now his frame, we may need to put a little bit of a beef on him. Yeah, go. right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But, but but he's got a lot of big playability, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I mean, that that seems to be where they're pointing to with him with his second rounder, and and I think he's you know easily in that particular area. I, you hit right on top of what I was going to hit. Is I think the one thing that that probably draws the most question marks about Troy Franklin is the frame. You know, 175, 180, 185 pounds in there. He's a lean 6'2", and could get pushed around quite a bit and, and frankly, manhandled the line of scrimmage by NFL DBs because of that. Um, But you can't teach speed, right? I mean, he just has that top-end gear that is different, way different than anybody else and extremely productive the last two years, you know, from the receptions and yards and it was kind of a, a travesty if you're a Duck fan that he wasn't on the Blitnikoff list last year as one of the best wide receivers in the country. You know, Roma Dunze and him were the two best out here west by far. But the combo of speed and route running that he has, he's unselfish. Uh, the bulk is what he's going to need a little bit more to be able to get so he doesn't get out physical, the muscle at the line of scrimmage. And one thing, you know, that, that, that I saw over time, and I can't say he did this in every game, but there was one thing I saw probably every three or four games is catching the ball clean before he heads up field. There were a lot of times where he would not catch it clean, would mm. bobble it and drop it, or bobble it while he's headed upfield and then get the ball knocked out before he ever controlled it. It's just a little thing like that I think is going to be a big thing at the NFL level because those guys are so good yeah. at stripping the ball, let alone making contact when the ball arrives. I, I, I watched this kid, man, Troy Franklin, and, and I know he's been getting comparisons to some of the, the slender wide receivers like a Devontae Smith, even an OBJ. Uh, But what I know about OBJ playing here, his willingness to block. You know, he wasn't a big guy, I don't know, maybe 185 max when he was here with with New York when I was here, but he was willing to block. Is Troy Flank one of those guys, because it's not, you know, about the physical tools when it comes to blocking necessarily, it's more about the mindset. Yeah, that's a, that's another question that I've seen come up about Troy Franklin is his ability to be a consistent contributor and blocker on the outside, and I think that's going to be something that the teams and the scouts going to have taken a look at already. When you really break down his film, there are points in time where he does, but not consistently. And uh, you know, from a standpoint of that mentality to stick your nose into nasty situations on the outside as a 180 pound guy, you know, that's the big question mark I think for Troy Franklin. So it's going to be that top end speed and the route running versus his ability to block on the outside and catch the ball clean. I think is going to be that back and forth as to whether you take him in the second round or not. Two other guys on offense said I don't think the Giants are going to be interested in the center, Jackson Powers Johnson who's got some pretty good grades on him coming out. But at some point later on, they might be interested in Bucky Irving, the running back, because the Giants seem to be looking at a running back by committee this year now that you know Saquon Barkley has gone to Philadelphia and they signed Devin Singletary to be their lead back. What's your take on both of these players, more specifically Irving, because I don't think the Giants are in the market for a center? Yeah, I, I like Bucky, and he was uh, really good here after he transferred from Minnesota. 2,000 yards in two seasons, you know, six-plus yards of carry. Uh, he didn't have to carry the load, so he wasn't a guy that got 25 or 30 carries a game, and, and that helped a lot. You talked about running back by committee, and somewhat was that way here where he didn't have to carry the load, and yet he stayed healthy, durable, doesn't fumble the ball, um, multi-purpose back is what makes him so dangerous. He's a really good runner and an excellent receiver as a running back. And, in fact, you can not only have him out of the backfield, but he lines up in the slot position is in a, and is a really effective uh, route runner, mm-hmm. uh, very sure hands. Not a big guy, you know. He's 5'9", 190, but he, he, he tends to be a guy. It's funny, you go back and talk about Troy Franklin and is he willing to stick his nose in. Bucky Irving does not go down. He's kind of a nasty runner is not easy to bring down, is kind of elusively strong. He's got explosive speed. 
the big thing for him is the top end speed. If he gets out in the open field, he pulls away from guys that first 10 or 15 yards mm-hmm. and then they'll catch him at 30 or 40. So four, five, five, he ran pretty good speed for a guy like that. But at the same time, the top end speed is what maybe hurts him when he breaks into the open field, but very quick, very elusive, great dual threat type of running back. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm hoping he's there. Ten yard split, day. not bad. What I'm no. looking at right here, and look, my, I went against Darren Sproles. He was one of my teammates. <laughs> what made him so good? He was short. Of course, he was smaller than everybody else. He could get to top speed faster than everybody else. Sproles not a burner. Sproles probably similar type of speed with this guy but his 10 yard split was probably something similar to that and that matters in the nfl Mm -hmm. because plays they're over like this those linebackers are four yards off the ball they can get to you quickly but if you can get to that second level quickly you know there's some success that could be there is he a returner can he return the football uh he took kickoff returns they've had him on on kickoff returns so that, that was the one. He didn't do any type of punt returning, but kickoff returning, yeah. Yeah, they put him back there, and he did quite a bit of that. So, um, But, I'll, yeah, the other, th- the other thing with him is the pass blocking, you know, from the standpoint of the undersized yeah. piece of it. I, I wonder what he's going to be on that. I think that's one of the big question marks from him at that next level in the NFL is his ability to pass block. Uh, Paul alluded to it earlier. We're not really looking at center. You know, we've not got really. John Michael Smith last year. But where do you see Jackson Powers Johnson falling in his draft? You see him as a late first – Second, where do you see him falling at? I see him, yeah, probably late first. I mean, he's he's a pretty good player. He's a big boy, uh, too. He, he's a guy, <laughs> yeah, he's a big boy that can move. I mean, he's an athletic guy that can move and, frankly, can play at different positions along the offensive line if they didn't want to take him as a center or, or play him that way. I mean, he's a Remington Award winner, so, you know, center is his, his forte, but he's played a lot of different positions when he was here at Oregon, can play a lot of different ones. He's mobile. He's strong. He's really good at getting to that second level and blocking downfield with his athleticism and his speed. He can be pretty dominant on the inside. And, you know, I think the big thing for him is he he gets a little upright sometimes, so gets off balance and could get, you know, pushed around a little bit that way. And and, and no doubt he's going to get better at that piece of it. And just length. You know, he's a big boy, but I wouldn't say he's a long-armed type of guy. So defenders with wingspans might cause him a little bit of problem. But still, yet I think he's one of the top three or four offensive linemen overall in the draft. I think he'll be a first-rounder, yeah. All right, let's go to defense, uh, Mike. Uh, There are two guys right up at the top that that I'm kind of interested in, one more so than the other, defensive end and Brandon Dorless. And then to me, Kyrie Jackson, a very long guy at corner, who is very, very intriguing for me uh, since the Giants could use some depth at cornerback. So I'm going to ask you to start with Jackson first, and what do you think okay. about his transition? Well, I think for a guy that's 6'4", you know, 200-ish or so to run a 4'5", puts him <laughs> right in there to be able to play, you know, to play the, the role. And you don't find very many six foot no. four, you know, corners no. from that standpoint. Well, they move so, in the safety is what they do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. You make him six four, two fifteen or twenty. <laughs> make him a safety. Is that right? <laughs> that's sure. kind of scary. So, but you know, from from a length standpoint, I mean, you just again the ability to be able to have that length in press coverage. He loves playing press coverage, and he does a really nice job in that press coverage type of situation and disrupting routes. Uh, he's a good ball tracker. Uh, he's not afraid to tackle. He's not shy about sticking his nose in and, 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 and going after people. He's you know, an aggressive big type of guy. He's very fluid in his movements that he makes. And so hips move, turn, getting into lanes, you know, that type of deal. That's the type of thing that really you know, puts him in a situation. You know, he launched his program or launched his career. Here, really. I mean, he, he was at Alabama, and right. Alabama's loaded a lot of different positions. And so on to Oregon, he came. And man, I'll tell you what, he was a difference maker in this defensive backfield last year as Oregon's defense really got good. And he was a big reason why. So, really good anticipation. But again, I just love his ball tracking skills and not afraid to be up in that press position at six foot four. Love a guy like that. How, how's his tackling? And I ask you that because, you know, he may, you know, end up on a roster. You know, but he'd probably be on the back end of the roster, just like most rookies will be if that's not drafted in the first, you know, couple of rounds. So I see him as kind of fitting into that special teams mode, maybe as a gunner or something, you know, kick return, whatever the case is. How do you yeah. think his mindset would be trying to tackle those big running backs and those big wide receivers returning in the NFL? Yeah, he's not. I, 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 I he's not a catcher. 
let me put it that way. There's okay. there's certain guys that like to catch the, catch the uh, tackles, mm-hmm. and you know, obviously from playing in the league and that type of. There are certain guys that go after, him, and he'll go after. Him. He's not afraid to stick his nose in. He's not shy. He's a really good open field tackler. Um, again, I think that is all a part of the package that he brought here that Oregon, frankly, didn't have at that position until he arrived. Mike, is there anybody else? Uh, well, actually, we, we just skipped Doorless. Actually, we didn't we didn't get a take yeah. on Doorless from you. And then I was going to ask, is there somebody else, a dark horse, that we haven't mentioned who we should be keeping an eye on? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, with Brandon Doorless, let me just go there first. I mean, he's a guy, he, he, to me, he's kind of a tweener. And that is what when he and, and Thibodeau played together here, mm-hmm. they could move those guys around to different positions, defensive end on the inside. If you took and put another 15, 20 pounds on top of him, he could play inside. If he wants to play at two, 285, he's athletic and play on the outside. An unending motor, very athletic, explosive, not afraid, and does track guys down from behind. I think that's, you know, Again, never having been in the NFL, but the one difference I see with those guys is like Kayvon Thibodeau, guys that can run down people from behind that just <laughs> never stop pursuing people all over the floor, all over the field. That's exactly what Brandon Dorless does. And that two-time All-Pac-12 guy, when he and KT were playing together, I mean, everybody knew what KT was, but the amount of people two years ago when those guys played together that would say, hey, we know about KT, but tell us about Dorless. He's really good. He is really good, and I think he's going to have a, an opportunity to probably be drafted third roundish. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised. And then the last couple of guys, maybe I would mention, would be oh Evan Williams, who was a transfer from Fresno State. Safety. Um, he safety. Might, a safety, yeah. A lean, a lean two hundred pound safety. So his biggest thing, just probably like Troy Franklin that we began with. He'd have to probably put on 10, 15 pounds to be able to be effective in the NFL. But he's one of those guys that you talk about that's sudden. When he makes a decision, it's sudden. It happens immediately. It's just like a blur. And, again, I, we saw that when Oregon played Georgia. You know, it's funny, Jonathan, you talk about the NFL. And I I've, I've, haven't been to very many NFL games. But when, we, when Oregon played Georgia at the beginning of last season, when Bo Nix got his first, you know, game back there for Oregon Duck, and or the Ducks just got their asses kicked. Excuse my language, but <laughs> it was one of those. It, it was. Yeah, I felt like we were watching an NFL team because everything is sudden. When that hole opens, it's shut. If somebody looks like they're going to run 15 yards, they get four. Yep. And and that's nice. the way that Evan Williams is. Evan Williams is one of those guys that when he makes his decision. He arrives suddenly, and he's just going to have to be a guy with a four six forty. Uh, it's going to be tough, you know. But he's going to yeah. have to be a five eleven two fifteen guy. Uh, and if that's the case, I think he can help out, play special teams. He could be a contributor for some some team out there. So love the guy. I hope he makes it. So I like it. You talked about Brandon Dorless. You talked about basically his versatility and also his motor. Two things that I think translates very well over Mm -hmm. to the NFL level. But when you look at all these guys, and you know you've been covering these guys for years, which one of these guys sticks out in terms of the intangibles that, you know, no matter what you look at on paper, you can't really describe it. You can't really see it until you see it in person, until you're around those guys. Which one of these guys, the Bo Nixes, which one of these guys possesses those intangibles that's like unquestionable, no matter what he does, whether he, he makes it an NFL or he doesn't make it an NFL, but he just has it in him to be successful. Which one of these guys has that potential? Yes, Bo. Yeah. It's Bo. I mean, it just it. There's. I mean, you compared him to Drew Brees, and Drew Brees has all those <laughs> intangibles. Yeah, there's just something different about the guy, and you know, I, I again, I hope he doesn't get thrown to the wolves. But at the same time, it wouldn't surprise me if he does get thrown to the wolves right off the bat. Happened a lot last year, Mike, and he excels. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, it did. A lot You're of backup right. quarterbacks play last year. A lot mm-hmm. of guys. Yeah, and so. You know, if he does, I got no doubt that he's going to fit right in right away and, and going to be successful. So I'm really excited to see what he does at the next level. He's just been so consistent in what he's done since the bowl game with the senior bowl and the different uh, combines and everything else that they've done. He's just been consistent all the way through carrying what he did here for two years. So 
Hope the guy has a great career. Mike, we have another minute with you, if we could. I want to ask you about the guy you called KT. We call him Tibbs here, or, or Kayvon. Uh, I guess KT was his nickname at Oregon. But uh, Thibodeau, to me... The closer is to the me, nickname that well, he's Oh, yeah, given. right? <laughs> you know, that rookie season, he had the sprained MCL coming out of camp. Yeah. And the first half of his rookie year, he was wearing a brace. Jonathan would sit next to me in the box and say, look... With the brace on, he's not the same guy. Got rid of the brace, had a strong second half of the rookie season, and then last year put in a little bit more power, a little more muscle, a little more size. I thought he wore down the last few weeks of the season, but had a good second season in the league where he had double-digit sacks. Where do you think his ceiling is? Well, uh, you know, to me, the biggest thing that you just mentioned for KT, I thought was going to be, the, the, you know, putting on the weight and sizing up a little bit and still using that athleticism to be able to, you know, be one of his strengths. And and I'm glad he did because I just thought that uh, if he could play at, you know, what is he now, 250? Yeah, he's probably right about that. 255 yeah, maybe, I'm, maybe. Yeah, I mean, he's he's so athletic. He is just so athletic that he can play with whatever weight is on him. And I think the the sky is the limit for that guy. He's going to get better and better. He is a workhorse, a workaholic at everything he does. Uh, hadn't been injured very much when he was here at Oregon, so that injury to start with right off the bat in his career, I know had to have frustrated the guy and probably frustrate a lot of people because they wanted to see him in action. But uh I really think he's going to be have a great career uh, there for the Giants, and, and if he ends up someplace else, some way, shape, or form, he's going to continue. He's going to have a long career. He's going to have a durable career, and he's going to have a very productive career. And I think the ceiling, again, for him is is Giants. really high. He's just going to continue to get better and better. Love the guy. Love the guy. So. Well, Mike, uh, keep rooting for Big Blue out there on the West Coast. We certainly like to have a, a friendly voice out there. He is Mike Jorgensen, the Oregon radio analyst and former quarterback of the Ducks. And, again, uh, we wish you all the best and enjoy your season. And, uh, again, Mike, we can't thank you enough for giving us the lowdown on the prospects this year. Hey, guys, thanks for having me on. Go G-Men. Really appreciate you guys. Thanks. Be well. Thank you. Good stuff. Uh, it's hard for me. Because I think the people who are in the Bo Nix camp have a very hard time finding some warts. I, I know he's got to clean up the mechanics a little bit. I know that the arm is not going to be the strongest in the NFL. He's got a good enough arm. Yeah. He's got, he's, it's above average. It's not, it's not a cannon like Kerry Collins had, mm -hmm. to use a, a Giants analogy. But the dude is so mature. He has all the leadership skills, all the tools, all the poise. I loved him on tape. And when I met him at the Combine, it was like, okay, well, he's got all the intangibles too. Yeah, You know what it's like. You yeah. know because you've walked in a locker room before and you've come to grips with a teammate and you kind of get a vibe, yeah. right? He gives off a vibe. You know what's so funny too because he used the Drew Brees comparison. And, and, of course, my first team I ever played for was the Saints. Yeah. And the first meeting I ever had, Drew Brees took over the meeting. After there Sean you Payton talked for like five minutes, I was just like, oh, players? They take over <laughs> meetings like this? And he was talking to the team, addressing us. You know, but that's a, a, that's a very strong comparison that he, that he made. It says a lot. Mm -hmm. It says a lot. Uh, we continue with our previews here of NFL draft prospects, and we go from the Ducks of Oregon to Oregon State and the Beavers. And Ron Callen joins us. He is an Oregon State sideline reporter and host of the Beaver Sports Podcast out there on the West Coast. We just got done with Oregon, Ron, so we just bring it uh, down the roadway to you and appreciate your time today. Hope all is well. All is great. They, uh, I guess there's some Big Ten team down the road now, I guess. Uh, about <laughs> <laughs> uh, too you got to put your big boy pants on. on. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Ron, thank you so much for taking some time today. And obviously the first guy that comes to mind when anybody mentions Oregon State around this time of year has got to be Fulaga, the offensive tackle, who many people think is going to be one of those tackles who's quickly off the board high in the first round. What are some of your observations about him from watching this guy play? I'll tell you what. Uh, watching him up and close on the sidelines for – uh, four years. This guy is pretty amazing. So big and strong. But the key about him is his attitude. He is a hard worker. Uh, never say die. He'll play hurt. He uh, got great tutelage from offensive line coach uh, 
uh, Jim Mahalchek, who now is at Michigan State. Mm-hmm. But uh, at least he just he's, he's a charming guy, too. Uh, you, you brought up the podcast. If you go back and listen to the October 26th weekly uh, podcast, he's the guest. We go into depth with his life, and uh, I think you get a good insight into him. But uh, look what he did in Indianapolis. I mean, he had those cats <laughs> looking at stuff. I mean, he, he, is, he is a guy that if you want somebody that's going to stick around for maybe 10, 12 years and be a mainstay on the offensive line, I, I would take a serious look at Talisi Fuaga. I like it. I like it. You know, and, and it's so crazy that these big guys, they're really – it's a sexy position now. Tackle in the NFL is now a sexy position. Well, you get paid. It's a high priority, you get paid. Come on. high priority position. <laughs> and I say this over and over again. You have to block, you know, at tackle. You have to block, I think, the best athletes in the entire world in any sport. They're big, they're strong, they're lean, they're fast, and you're going backwards. Ron, and that's going an outside forwards. linebacker talking, okay? <laughs> and I'm Just not, so you know. I can't, you can't compare me to any of these pass rushers nowadays. <laughs> well, he, now. knows all, he knows all about offensive tackle, no doubt about Yeah, for that. sure. The other thing Go about Delisi, loyalty. He is loyal, and he loves his teammates. And, you know, there were, there were opportunities possibly. You know how nowadays it's chaos in the world of college sports with NIL mm-hmm. and the sure. portal. But this guy, you know, stayed here in Corvallis and helped build a, a team that's now been to the bowl games three years in a row. And we expect even with the new era here, uh, that'll continue in 2024. But, uh, I mean, they're going to miss him on the offensive line. Joshua Gray, who's another guy who's got a lot of experience, has decided to stick uh, he's got one more year of eligibility, but uh, you know that'll be somebody we could talk about next March. Okay, is is he a dual threat, as in right and left, or just he's a right oh, tackle? Yeah, yeah? You know, Talisi, swing tackle. Talisi, yeah, he's mainly been the right tackle, but he can move around. He he, he played a couple of games at guard. He, he he's he's versatile, but the the main thing he is he is smart, you know, and he gets it. He has got a great football IQ. What will be his biggest adjustment then? I mean, it seems like right now you're you're saying he's got the whole toolbox. I, I think that's it. I think you know he's <laughs> not going to have to, he's not going to be like some wide-eyed kid. This guy's experienced. He's been in some huge games. You know, a year before last, I mean, the bees were down twenty-one-three to those ducks you brought up, and he was part of the package <laughs> that brought them back in the second half and beat the rival. Right? So, I mean. <laughs> This guy, this guy is, I mean, I can see why NFL scouts have him ranked so high. And if I were the New York Giants, man, I'd take a serious look. All right, I want to ask you about someone on defense who will go later in the draft, but because he's at a position the Giants are a little thin, Ryan Cooper Jr. Uh, has played inside slot and also played outside, if I'm not mistaken. And I read something to the effect that over the last two seasons, he had like two dozen passes defensed and a handful of interceptions. So what do you think about him potentially as a depth piece for somebody in the draft? You know, uh, Ryan Cooper Jr. is is a tremendous athlete. He's versatile. Uh, I mean, he had a pick six this year that, uh, you know, created chaos in the stands because this guy's exciting and this guy's not afraid. This guy is not afraid to deliver some punishment to the offensive side of the ball. You know, and, and Ryan's uh, one of these guys who's just ready to play every down. He got injured part of the time this past year with an ankle, but uh, this guy is solid. And, I mean, you, you need consistency and depth if you're going to have a tremendous defense. The Giants have had him in the past, and I don't see why Ryan Cooper Jr. wouldn't make a good addition to any NFL team. And, you know, I, I could see him as a late round guy. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of competition at that position. It's a but deep spot looking, in this uh, draft. It really is at corner. Yeah. And I think he's gotten a lot of attention. I think he's performed well in postseason. As far as, you know, people, when we had our pro day here in Corvallis, uh, what week ago, Monday, I um, mean, you know, he was one of the guys here who performed well. So, uh, I could see Ryan Cooper Jr., you know, really becoming a solid NFL standout. And who knows? He's big and strong. I mean, he's got some size, too. Uh, look, I, I liked uh, what I saw from Aladapo. I, I put on his little highlight film real quick, and that guy, 
He's a guy that can go up and track that ball when it's in the air. It looks like he's not afraid of contact. He's put his face right in there against running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, whoever. Where do you see him uh, kind of landing at in this draft? Do you see him, you know, middle of the rounds, late? You know, where do you see this guy falling? The Tan Oladapo is amazing. I mean, he dyed his hair orange this year. He was so committed <laughs> to the Beavers, right? That's but, awesome. That's, but, you can't tell that with a helmet on. I didn't know that. <laughs> All right, so so the Giants just got, got Mills. They brought him in from the Patriots, and he's got green dye yeah, yeah, hair green. and calls himself the Green Goblin. Yeah. So now if we got if we got a guy with green hair and orange hair, we got a pumpkin secondary. <laughs> hey, the, the Irish flag is green and orange, guys. You know? I mean, but uh, – Catan, one thing he has, guys, his speed is tremendous for the position he plays. I've seen him catch up to wide receivers and come from behind and, and bring them down. Uh, and he, he also loves football. He loves being out of practice. He loves being, you know, part of a team that cares for each other. And, uh, but he might be one of the more unheralded uh, guys in the draft could really make a difference because uh, he, you know, all of these guys we're talking about have been around in college football. They're, they're, you know, these guys have played a lot of football here in Corvallis. Uh, some guys come in here as three-star guys. Maybe you'll get a couple of four-stars, but the five-star guys don't come to Corvallis like they do to Oregon. But these guys develop here, and, I mean, he was so emotional after the Sun Bowl, even though it was a dreadful game and the Beavers had, like, half the roster, right, because of the coaching change and, and all the other stuff going on. But he, he stuck it out. He played in El Paso against Notre Dame and was one of the shining stars on a dreary day. Uh, so, I mean, Patana Oladapo, when I think about him, I smile. If, if you go on, I mean, I'm not plugging my, my Twitter page, but if you go to at Ron Callen, okay. go back to last fall, You'll see some of his post-game interviews, and you'll go, "Wow, I'm impressed." And because uh, I put all of my post-game interviews, whether it's football or women's hoops, which I'm involved in right now, because we've got the uh, NCAA tournament. I know here. you're busy. Uh, I, we appreciate the time too. <laughs> no, no, but you go on that uh, Twitter, go back in a couple of months, you'll see post-game interviews with him. And uh, this guy is, is pretty impressive. I mean, if you wanted a, a speaker for a uh, you know a pregame dinner for some fans or something, I'd have him go there because he is he's sharp, he's articulate, but most of all, he's a tremendous athlete who's got great vision on defense. You know, he and anticipation. You got to have those two things if you want to get to that next level. These the two last guys that we were talking about, Aladapo and Ryan Cooper Jr. And this is a serious question: Do they have it all? When I say have it all, I you know you look at these guys. It's like you know maybe they'll excel on special teams, but I feel like a little bit of that you got to be a little off to excel on special teams. <laughs> like, are they a little quirky? Or they look like they might not have it all? And I'm talking about like they'll just run into a wall because if you ha- if you do think like that, then you will have success on special teams in the NFL. You know, you, you got to do that. And these guys, obviously, they have the ability to play special teams. They both have during their the years here in Corvallis. But, you know, as far as running through walls, you know, I, I was an offensive guy, a wide receiver. And, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd run through a wall, but I would say I would love to be like Isaiah Hodgins, who was a former Oregon mm-hmm. State Beaver. Mm-hmm. You guys – up and look at look at him he was a guy who was so good in college but they said oh he's too slow he doesn't have the the moves you know to get open hey i think he's proved everybody wrong yeah. not only at buffalo but when he moved over to the giants and hopefully i'm not sure if his status is still with the giants now but hopefully uh he'll he'll stay there if, if one of those guys comes in he knows them he'll help him get used to the giants football that's cool. That's, That's cool for sure. Yeah. yeah, he had a bit of a down year last year, but he still signed in on the roster. The offense had a bit of a down uh, year. Oh, that's last for sure. Year. The entire offense. Yeah. That's a good point, Jonathan. All right, Ron, fi- final thought. Uh, t- yeah. Tell me about the mosquito type wide receiver you have <laughs> who ran in the four threes and stands at only five foot eight. Now, I don't necessarily see him as a fit for the Giants because they've already got some small guys in the room like McKenzie and Wondell Robinson and. Uh, so I don't necessarily think he fits here, but when a guy runs in the four threes, uh, there are people in the NFL who take a look. Anthony Gould is—he's uh, been an amazing Oregon State Beaver. You know, he battled through all the COVID stuff when we were playing games in front of cardboard cutouts. Uh, but the main thing about Anthony Gould 
okay, let's say you've got a quarterback who's pretty versatile, a little bubble screen to mm-hmm. Anthony Gould. Give him a little bit of space, and he can get going with that 4-3 speed. He's off and running. He had a few touchdowns here with the bubble screen. He was a punt returner. He could return kickoffs. Look at the East-West Shrine game. He returned one for a touchdown, a punt. So uh, this guy has tremendous speed. And he's also on that podcast, I think it was January, when he was working out for the East-West Shrine game. Anthony Gould, I think, would be great for any team if you want somebody who's got blinding speed. And the other thing about a, a great receiver, he can catch the ball in traffic. He's not afraid to take a hit from an outside linebacker or anybody else. I mean, Anthony is the kind of guy that is a winner. And you want guys like that on your roster. And he has been so dedicated to his profession and his sport. I mean, going down to Florida uh, in December to work out in the hot sun, make sure he's in shape for that East-West Shrine game. And then, uh, you know, I I know that uh, he is a guy with tremendous upside who is ready to go and ready to, you know, I mean, to find a blinding, fast uh, returner, that can make a difference in a key situation. If, I, if I'm an NFL GM, I, I've got to take a good look at Anthony Gould. Well, as long as a, a, a little quick guy has that toughness and that, that heart the size of uh, Mount Everest, he'll, uh, he'll be able to find a spot he'll in the league. Fine. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Where do you see him going? Where do you see him going? Is he, is he a, a late uh, third-day guy, so, second-day guy? <clears throat> I think he's the late second-day, early third-day. I hmm. really do. You know, because, I mean, his, his pedigree, and if you watch his highlight packages, you're going to go, oh, okay. Yeah, this guy can get it done. Yeah, he's not a, he's not, five eight. I get it. I get it. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure what his vertical leap is, but I know it's pretty darn good. <laughs> and the main thing is when you're, what, four three nine at the Combine, I mean. I know. Uh, I know. That, that number kind of sticks out, doesn't that's it, That's rolling. Ron? Yeah, that's rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Ron Callen, the host of the Beaver Sports Podcast and also the Oregon State sideline reporter for Beavers Football. Thank you so much for your time today and talking about the prospects. We appreciate it. Stay well. Hey, appreciate the time and good luck to you guys. Thanks, boss. So uh, it sounds like they've got uh, they got some really good players out there in the state of Oregon. Yeah. We, yeah. Just, we just talked to two experts now with two of the programs and – not only did they tell us about the toolbox, but they gave us a lot of good intangibles mm-hmm. about these players. Uh, didn't hear much much to question other than, okay, well, it's still making a big jump to the NFL. That's, you know, nobody is perfect when they come right out of the box. We get that. But it sounds like uh, these guys check an awful lot of the uh, the boxes on the checklist. I, I know you, you you're scouring, you know, the college ranks right now. For potential fits for the New York Giants, out of all of these guys from Oregon and Oregon State, you see any of the guys fitting into this locker room? Well, if if the intangibles that that were described to us are accurate, I think any of these guys would fit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, Jonathan, you've been on enough of teams to know the mixture of guys is is can be very important. Yes, very very important. I think what Joe Shane and Brian Dable have done to this Giants locker room, besides trying to get guys who can play, obviously that's always number one, but it's clear to me that this locker room does value football acumen and character and selflessness. You know, when Shane says smart, tough, and dependable, um, those things really count for something with him. It's not just a phrase. Yeah. Yeah, and and they're bringing in guys that fit that mold. You know, I I've, I've been saying this on the show since they came that you know, they they're bringing in high character guys. And that matters a lot, especially when things may not be going so well for you like it did this past season. You know, yeah. there were there was no turmoil in the locker room the entire year. You know. No. And it was it got rough. <laughs> it got rough this past year. You know, but there was no turmoil. There was no dissension between coaches and players. You know, I think they stuck it out. And maybe in, in the back end, you know, with <laughs> with Wink Martindale being out, maybe it was something there, but it wasn't nothing with the players, though. You know, so I the think... The players supported all the coaches. Right, they're doing Wink a, a great together. job in finding not only talent, 
but also high character guys that will be able to deal with adversity, which you will have in the NFL with the microscope being as focused as it is in this market. 201-939-4513. We've got about, what, 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes left in the program. That's it. Well, we had a lot of information. It went fast, though. I felt like we had like 30 minutes left. So so dial us up, especially if you're a first-time caller, long-time listener, 201-939-4513. We'll be here to take your calls about Giants football to the bottom of the hour. Make sure you uh, also check out the Giants Huddle podcast. you got players, coaches, front office people, former players, uh, national media people, all talking about uh, Giants football and the draft. You can subscribe or go to your favorite podcast platform. Or go to Giants.com slash podcasts. Don't forget, uh, if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star positive review. It helps keep the program alive. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind, Giants TV is the official Giants TV streaming app. It brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. And take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, including in the winter and the spring. Uh, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2024 NFL season. To learn more about the all-exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. So, just to make sure you guys understand, again, 201-939-4513 is our phone number here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. We are here all weekdays from 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 in the afternoon every uh, weekday live. And then you can catch us on the archive if you just want to listen in. But, Jonathan, you know, you, you're, you've only been with us now since last season. So um, this is an annual thing for us. We, we've been going through this tradition probably for the last 10 years or so where we get to about a month away from the NFL draft, and every day we'll have one, two, or three experts from individual college programs as we start to talk about these prospects who may be of interest to the Giants, maybe they're just of interest to some other NFL team. That doesn't matter. The important thing is we're trying to bring you guys information from people who are there. We're trying mostly to get your radio analysts or your pre- and post-game guys, your sideline guys, because they're the ones more in the trenches. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who really know a lot more about the players than other guys. And I think that's part of part of what we're trying to do here. And we, we've done this now for a lot of years. I'm glad you're a part of it now. And, you know, we just found out a whole bunch of stuff about the Oregon uh, Ducks and, and the Oregon State Beavers. And, and I think the fun part about it for me is that it's a great way to get an education you know, to listen to these folks who have firsthand eyewitness experience with these players. They've talked to them. They've watched them uh, as people and as players. And they can give us a better feel than somebody just calling up a computer. Yeah, I, I fully agree. They're finding the Paul Tinos and the John Schmokes in, in these, these organizations and these programs, which is awesome. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about the other day. I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before. Uh <laughs> It was you and Lance on here on BBKL. I love, I watch BBKL too, in case you guys didn't know. So I will be tuning in. The man helps his own ratings. I, I, I love I, it. I will be tuning in to learn more about these college prospects because as you know, I don't really watch college football. I, I choose not Understood. to watch it. For me, it's it would be too much. It would be an overload It's It's a cram, yeah. trust me. From the time that, that John and I go out to the combine, it's a cram it, it, session. It's, it's, a, a, it's a multiple yeah. headache every day. So when you told me we were, you know, I had made sure I looked at the guys that we were going to speak right. to today of course all of the prospects but two things number one Wilson called and got you and Lance going at it that was hilarious you like that. and then that kid Billy <laughs> that kid Billy that was he good he was amazing he was so good one of the best callers I've ever heard how old was he because he didn't give you age you know Pearson, Billy, did he give you age Billy Billy you called us the other day I would love to hear you call back the program sometime during the course of the next week we because we we yeah he reminded me of me when I, I yeah. was 10 years you old. You said, you called him fair? What did you, you call him? It, you, you called him something, and it was. It was good. It was so good, uh, like a fair analysis or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was real terrific. Good. He was yeah. logical. He was reasonable. He asked legitimate questions. N nothing with our regular callers, but he was the youngest, kid, youngest person I've ever heard call up. Before. What I love the fact is that he had not been soiled by propaganda. Right. You know? He had not just taken the narrative that, that you know, people are spewing 
all over the place about all these different things. No, he just wanted to cut to the meat and potatoes and get the real answers to the real questions. Something that he's been wondering for a while. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I like that I a lot. I love that. I, listen. Too many people just look at the internet, see a rumor, and then they just come on and they start blowing up about a rumor. Listen, and there's a lot of callers out there. Like, I have friends that watch the show that's like, I don't know what to talk about. It's like, bro, look, if you have a question that you want to ask about the Giants, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If it helps to write it down, that helps too. Sure. You know, but call and ask. You know, we're willing to talk and, and converse about all of these things. And you have literally two different perspectives here, let alone age. You know, <laughs> I'm a little bit younger than yeah. Paul. Yeah, just a little you bit. You know, just a little bit. A guy that's basically been on the other side of it I got the whole socks time. Older than you. <laughs> <laughs> you better get rid of them socks. <laughs> uh, and then the player perspective as well that went through certain things. You know, I went through the combine, I went through the offseason stuff. I was supposed to get drafted, didn't get drafted i won a super bowl play for the giants was a captain special teams like i i you know i, I touched oh, a lot awesome. of different things and awesome. you know it's fun being on this show it's fun listening to the show when you lance and 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 everybody john and and howard and madeline all of you guys different perspectives and you guys are all knowledgeable and then the callers even the consistent callers and when i heard billy i was like first of all how old is this kid i'm telling and you and i'm man. like yo is he he sound like he was 12 but he, he talked like he was 18, 19 in maturity level. It's 1.30, which means uh, if school had lunch break, he's probably already back in class. But, Billy, call it. If you listen on the archive, Billy, give, give us, give yeah, us a call am, back another time next? when you get a chance. Let him know when All right. I'm on next. In the meantime, <laughs> let's go to the phones. Marty in Manahawkin is on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello, Marty. Hey, Paul. Hey, Jonathan. How you guys doing? What's Good up, to Marty? talk to you. Hey, listen. Uh, I've noticed, I think the Giants, it looks like to me, they're making a concerted effort to uh, bring back a lot of their uh, core special teams players uh, with these signings that I've, uh, I've seen. Uh, I don't know if you agree with me, but uh, you know that's what I've been seeing. Let me defer to our special teams captain right here because I could not agree with you more. Bringing back Darnay Holmes and Nick McLeod, to me, those were two of the best Four maybe special teams Coughlin covered too, guys. Though, Carter, yeah. Yeah, Carter Coughlin's Carter Coughlin's Coughlin. in there too. Mm -hmm. Come on. So what what do you see in those guys? How important is it that they're here? Well, every team that I've been on that had success in special teams, you had a core unit. And it was those guys that maybe played a little bit of defense or a little bit of offense, but they were, their main position was special teams, whatever that is. And they were specialists at it. You know, uh, I played on in New England with Matthew Slater. He was a specialist. I was really good too. When I got to New England, he made my job so much easier because everybody focused on him. They also had other guys like Nate Ebner, you know, mm -hmm. other guys that were always consistently being on special teams, contributors, making plays every single game. And I think it, it doesn't really get considered, especially during the offseason when everybody's talking draft, everybody's talking top prospect, quarterbacks, wide receivers. No one's talking about what value they bring to special teams. Every single team uh, we're going to speak to, I'm going to ask about their special teams, uh, 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 you know, probability. Like, is there guys, can these guys play special teams? Because it's a huge facet in today's game. And any, not today's game, in the NFL, it's a third of the game, and you have to have, I think, to have success, you have to have a core group of special teams guys that really don't care about offense, that don't care about defense, they care about making plays on special teams. The one thing about Nick McLeod, I think that that's really helpful, is that not only is he their best special teams cover guy, in my opinion, maybe you'll think differently. I think he's the best one they have, but he also proved that he can actually play in the secondary as well. Yes, and at, at, at a very, very functional level. He's a guy that you know, health. Hopefully, he stays healthy. He'll be able to play for a long time because he's a guy that could be like that corner safety kind of tweener. But he's a star worth on special team. So when you're trying to figure out who you want to bring in as a non-starter, you want to bring in a guy like that because he's going to add value to your team. And not to say he can't be a starter, mm -hmm. but when you have two starters and you need a backup, you need that backup to be good on special teams. It has to be that because that third safety, that third, fourth corner, they're going to play special teams. It's just a fact. Marty, just to uh, reinforce everything that you have just said and, and we have added to, Carter Coughlin led the Giants last year with nine special teams tackles. Cam Brown had eight, and Darnay Holmes had seven. Now, 
Nick, Nick McLeod doesn't necessarily get the tackles, but he's the guy down there impacting that return guy. He's and, a gunner. And, and as a gunner, mm. my goodness, he is so good at getting down there after that ball Forcing to make sure catches, yep. exactly that it's either a fair catch or that that ball gets it's died or dies or gets killed inside the 20 or the 10. Well, for that matter, make sure the guy doesn't field it and watches it go out of bounds. So, you know, I don't want to put McLeod's special teams value on a stat line because I think, I think his value on special teams is more than numbers. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Yeah, I, I hear Jonathan talking. He sounds all excited. It sounds like he's ready to put the uniform on and start running back and forth <laughs> up and down the field again. No, sir. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, thanks for taking my call. Thank you, Marty. 201-939-4513. We've got another couple of minutes. We'll take one more quick phone call if you guys have somebody out there who wants to give us a buzz. Uh, again, interestingly enough, when we talk about special teams, um, you know, oh, you were gonna you were gonna pop some up. I was just gonna show you this kid who has a lot of potential to be a really good special teamer for the New York Giants. Why don't you tell people who you popped up? Well, Bryce Ford Wheaton, you know, and it, like I said. When people are focusing on a, a lot of these NFL players in general, they want to know what they can do on offense or defense. Last year, I think uh, in preseason last year, I don't think he had a great offensive uh, uh, preseason. I think he dropped a couple passes, and he really didn't get that many opportunities. Had but on camp, special teams, but in preseason games, right, you didn't the games well. he didn't really show up. Right on special teams, though, from the little bit that I saw from yeah. him, he looked dominant. Not good. He looked dominant. He was using that big frame that he has, and he was moving guys, throwing guys out the way. And you know, maybe it wasn't against the first and uh, second. Maybe it wasn't against the first uh, unit of uh, of special teamers. But I think with an attitude that he has, I think he has that attitude, that mentality that he can have success for the Giants. And I think before he got injured, he might have made a team just on special teams alone last year. I think he was a good bet to make the team. He tore his ACL, yep. and that ruined his whole season. I know he's been rehabbing very, very aggressively, and I'm going to add one more name to that. I said the other day to Lance, and if you were listening, you probably caught me say it. I said it to John, too. There are two guys who have been hurt in the last two years who I'm going to keep my eye on during this training camp. Beavers. Gary and Beavers mm -hmm. and Bryce Ford Wheaton. I didn't mention Ford Wheaton the other day, and, and that was remiss of me because I think he's the second guy who has been like in that injury cloud that hasn't really had a chance to really show his wares in a regular season game yet. I think Ford Wheaton and Beavers are two very intriguing guys for me, and they would be like having two fresh draft picks yeah. if they could make the team because the two years that Beavers was here, he was hurt for a year, and then last year as he was trying to rehab the whole time on the practice squad, never really got, got a chance. And Wheaton lost this whole season to IR. So they would be like two found draft picks yeah. if they can make it back. Yeah, and that's what that's it. If you know, and and I hate to, to say it, but I know injuries do end most careers I know. in the NFL. Well, John hates it when we talk you about know, injured players because he says you, they're questions you can't count on them. I mean, I'm not saying I count on them. I mean, so we're not talking I'm, about Daniel Jones at all. <laughs> <laughs> the point is something. The point is I'm interested in these guys. Yeah, my my radar is out, I'm, and I'm with you because last year going into the season, I felt like you have Bobby Okereke. We were trying to figure out who that other linebacker was going to be, right? And Mike McFadden emerged as. I think he's, a really good he player sees the job. throughout the year, and he got better as the year progressed yeah. on. And I think Beaver is, look, it's hard to come back off of, a, of an injury like that at the position he plays, a position that requires a lot of lateral movement, yep. a, a position that requires movement when there's a 300-pounder against you. That puts a lot of stress on your knee. So hopefully he will come back 100% like he did two years ago when he had that phenomenal training camp. I would love to see both of those guys make the 53, help out on special teams, and maybe even get some rotational snaps in the lineup. That'll do it for this edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live as we began our NFL prospect previews with uh, Oregon, uh, with Mike Jurgensen, and Oregon State with Ron Callen. 
Uh, we hope you enjoyed those, and we will be back tomorrow with some more NFL draft prospect previews. For Jonathan Casillas, I'm Paul Dottino. As a reminder, you can find this show on the archive and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. This has been Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. So long, everybody.